Good evening, everyone. And welcome to our evening meeting. Saturday night. We're just about full up. If you weren't able to make it and you're watching this on YouTube, um, there's always the audio stream if you want to follow live. I got a limit here of 20 people, so not everyone can join us in in virtual reality. We have two meditators here in Hamilton, in somewhat less virtual reality, still virtual, still not ultimate reality. In ultimate reality there is only what we call Paramatta Dhamma. Actually, we translate Paramatta Dhamma as ultimate reality. Paramatta, Parama means highest. Atta means Atta means meaning, or in the highest sense. Dhamma is in the highest sense. We had two visitors today from Toronto. And I was explaining to them the four foundations of mindfulness and then I came to the fourth one and I said, well, Dhamma is a little bit hard to explain. And they nodded and said, yes, we know. Or they, they, made, they made a sign of the affirmative. Dhamma is a difficult word. It's used in many different ways. It's funny because before the Buddha came along it wasn't such a complicated word. It's not actually difficult, it's just complicated in Buddhism. Or by the time the Buddha came around. So a dharma is something that one holds, something that is held. Dhar is the root, means to hold or to carry. So it came to take on a, fi a sort of a, a figurative, in a figurative sense. The idea of holding on to some doctrine. So there was the Katya Dhamma, and the Brahmana Dhamma. It would be the code of the nobles and the priests. And then the... Uh, Whatever you call the merchants, the uh, Vesa, are they called? And the merchant class had their own dharma. And it was sort of a, a, a code of social order. Those who subscribed, or those who, who preached this code, uh, were intent upon keeping social order or, or maintaining a sort of an aristocracy or a case caste system whereby the nobles ruled the country and they had their duties as kings and rulers and warriors and the brahmins had their role as priests to perform religious ceremonies perpetuate the god perpetuate the gods The merchants had their merchant code, their honor in dealing with each other, in buying and selling and trading. And then of course the lowest class, well, it was a means of reminding them that, well, this is just uh, due to your karma. You were born into this lower class and you should just accept it. Vaisya is the Sanskrit, Vesa is Pali. The Vesa are the merchants, and the Suddhas are the lower class. 
So it's another means of of uh, telling the poor people that well, it's just part of your lot in life to be poor and hungry all the time. And and so this works as a sort of a social. Order. Anyway, the point was dharma was the this idea. And so in the when the Buddha came around, well, there were there were actually quite a number of religious teachers who didn't really buy into or maybe never had bought into the social structure of rulers and kings and merchants and so on and, and, and priests. They didn't buy into the religion of the Brahmins and so they would go off into the forest and preach their own dharma. Because they would see that the dharma, these other dharmas were actually quite corrupt in many ways. The, the dharma of the katyas meant they could kill with impetu impet impunity. Yeah. Kill with impunity as long as they were doing it. Uh, in accordance with the rules of war, killing was not wrong. That the Brahmins were greedy with impunity. They were cultivating all these myths and, and beliefs based on insubstantiated claims about reality. and hoarding money and hoarding possessions and talking about Brahma and, and holiness and yet having wives and female slaves and concubines and prostitutes and so on and eating and drinking in luxury and reaping the, the fruits of sacrifices and the Vesas would be all corrupt in their dealings with each other all about money and capitalism striving f for a bigger piece of the pie and then the Sudha as well, the, the, the idea that this was their Dhamma to suffer miserably well, there's had these rich people uh, lounged around in, in, in opulence so there were, there were, I think, a number of teachers even at the time of the Buddha who, for this and for other reasons, some just for the reasons that they wanted to be teachers on their own, out of a desire to be famous, they would teach an alternative doctrine. But often it was because they saw that society was quite corrupt in its nature. And the Buddha was one of these teachers. He left home seeing that this dharma is quite corrupt. He was set to become the king, but he saw this can't save me from suffering. This is only setting me up for great uh, attachment and addiction, setting me up for great suffering and its luxury. And so he left home to find a higher dharma or Dhamma, we would say in Pali. And so he went to two different teachers, and if you know the story of the Buddha, they taught their Dhamma, and he asked them, what is your Dhamma? And they taught it, and he mastered it, and he said, well, this Dhamma is still limited. And so eventually he came up with his own Dhamma. But this is where it starts to get complicated, is that the Buddha doesn't claim to have his own Dhamma. He claims to have realized the Dhamma in a different sense of the word. And so here the meaning is that which holds or that which is held, held up to investigation when you, when you learn about reality, these teachings, these truths Hold up. So in Buddhism, Dharma became Dhamma became to be known as reality, and so it's used interchange. It's used. Um, it's used in two different ways. There is the Dhamma, the the Paramatta Dhamma. These realities that the Buddha realized. And then there's the Sadhamma, which is 
the teachings of the Buddha and they're distinct. And it became even more complicated when he started using the, the, the reality's idea in terms of ideas. So we have uh, Dhamma, Dhamma Ramana. Anything that is the object of the mind is called a Dhamma Ramana. And Aramana is object. So you have Dhammas. And so when it comes to explain the fourth foundations of my, foundation of mindfulness, I haven't heard a satisfactory answer yet. What the word Dhamma means there I've asked monks, I've asked lay scholars I even asked my teacher And he just said it's Dhamma <laughs> Said something Quite simple I think he said it's Dhamma Chat Because in Thai they have this Well in, in Pali there's Dhamma Chati It just uh, the, uh, nature So the Dhammas are nature But in the context of the four foundations of mindfulness I think it just means the teachings Various teachings Various important Important specific teachings That are A part of the meditator's path Anyway, tonight I wanted to talk about the, the param Paramatta Dhammas Talk about this word Dhamma Because this is what we're trying to see We have this phrase When the Buddha was about to pass away He said uh, Whatever person Dhamma nu Dhamma Patipat Patipano Anyone who wishes to pay homage to the Buddha, should practice the Dhamma in line with the Dhamma. Dhamma nu Dhamma. So this is often, this is interpreted to mean practicing the, the, the teachings to realize the truth. And here we, so we are, here we have the use of the two different versions of the word Dhamma. Dhamma nu Dhamma. Practicing the Dhamma in order to realize the Dhamma it means practicing the four Satipatthana in order to realize Nibbana, in order to realize the end of suffering. Or in order to see the Dhammas. And so it's this idea of seeing the Dhammas that we... Uh, that we focus on in our practice of Satipatthana. All four Satipatthana involve seeing the Dhammas, seeing reality. When we focus on the body, we're not actually concerned about the body. We're concerned with Dhammas that are physical. We're concerned with experiences, things that arise and cease moment after moment. Movements of the body, the, the sensation of moving, touching, the sensation of heat and cold, hard, soft. The tension in the various parts of the body, for example, in the stomach, which is an object of meditation that we use. Each of these is a Dhamma because it holds up to, rea to an investigation. The idea of whether the body exists is just a, a matter of opinion, it's just a concept. When we look around in the room, we see other things and bodies. When we look down, we see our body. But whether it's actually there or not, it's just a belief, just a conjecture. We could just be in virtual reality Instead of actually sitting here We might all be hooked up In fact, this might all be a, a figment of our imagination I might be the only person in existence I don't know whether any of you actually exist But what I do know is that there is sensations There is tension when I 
make a fist there's tension when I breathe in there's tension when I'm in a hot room there's heat when I'm out in the cold there's cold When I stand on the hard floor, there's hardness. When I sit on a soft cushion, there's softness. There's these experiences. So they're dharma, they, they're dhammas. They actually exist for sure. Because they're actually experiences. And when Vedana is, is all of the feelings that we experience, whether painful or pleasant, Again, these arise and cease, but they're real. They're real not in the sense that they exist in, as an entity that comes and goes, but, but is always existent. No, they, they, they come from cessation and they go back to cessation. They, they, they don't exist permanently. But during the moment of experience, they're real. That's what it means to be a Dhamma. So when we watch the pain, we see it arising and ceasing. When we feel happy, we see it arising and ceasing. When we watch the mind, we see our thoughts, thoughts arising and ceasing. And finally the dhammas, but here dhammas in the sense of teaching, so we have the Nivarana Dhamma. These are dhammas that the Buddha taught. And they're also real, they're also dhammas in the sense of being real. Liking, disliking, drowsiness, distraction, doubt, these are experienced. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, these are dhammas. And so on. The importance of this is that there's a distinct difference between dhammas and uh, concepts. When we spend our time looking at concepts, when we see people and places and things, we're able to cultivate all sorts of ideas and views and beliefs about these things because they don't actually exist. When we see a person, we can have an idea of what they're like. We can build up a whole narrative about, oh, there's that person. We might base it on experiences. We might just base it on our own delusions. And often do. We get into a relationship with someone and we have this very powerful concept of what they're like and then they act in a different way and we get very upset or after some time our mind changes and our concept of them is no longer pleasing to us and, and we become bored and lose interest Because concepts don't play out in ultimate reality. I mean, reality continues according to very real you know, patterns, laws. But concepts don't. So by living in a world of concepts, we build up all these delusions. And based on our partialities, we build up ideas of what is good, what is bad that have no basis in ultimate reality. We think of certain foods as good, certain sights as good, certain sounds as good, and others as bad. And based on these beliefs and these uh, partialities, we, we strive to accumulate or we strive to escape. And we act in ways that are totally unrelated to ultimate reality. They're based on this illusory sense of the way things are and, and, and what thing, how things, how the world works. It's, all, it's like blind people, you know, 
living blind in a house and imagining what everything looks like. Meditation is like turning on the lights and suddenly you see. As you practice meditation, you suddenly see that these things that you were clinging to are not actually yours, not actually satisfying or beneficial or worth clinging to in any way. I mean, you don't see anything very esoteric or profound, but what's profound is the simplicity of it, is that by seeing the Dhammas, by seeing everything arise and cease, you straighten out all this crookedness in the mind, all the attachments and addictions and all the aversions and delusions. And your mind becomes pure. There's a great power to, to, to reality in this way. But it's important. You have to make this change. You have to make this shift. The mind has to come to understand reality in terms of dhammas or experiences. It's important that when we think of the Buddha Dhamma, we're not actually just thinking of the Buddha's teachings, learning them all and getting a, an intellectual sense of them. But we use the teachings in order to in order to see the truth, in order to see reality for what it is, which really is transformative, which truly does free us from addiction and aversion and, and ego and clinging and all that. So, there you go, there's the Dhamma for tonight. An encouragement for us all to strive to understand the Dhammas, to understand reality on an experiential level. Anyone has any questions? I'm happy to answer. there are no questions, then thank you all for coming. Good to see you all. I'm wishing you all a good night.